Okay, so Amber Rose is going to read the poem. Then I'm going to invite everybody to briefly comment. We've talked about this poem a lot, but I think now we're talking about it in relationship to um, to the photograph and also to the moment, which is particularly amazing, uh, given the first two lines in particular. So Amber Rose, thank you in advance for performing the poem. Boy Breaking Glass by Gwendolyn Brooks. Whose broken window is a cry of art, success that winks aware as elegance, as treasonable faith, is raw, is sonic, is old eyed premiere. Our beautiful flaw and terrible ornament, our barbarous and metal little man. I shall create, if not a note, a whole, if not an overture, a desecration, full of pepper and light and salt and night and cargoes. Don't go down the plank if you see there's no extension. Each to his grief, each to his loneliness and fidgety revenge. Nobody knew where I was and now I am no longer there. The only sanity, is a cup of tea. The music is in minors. Each one other is having different weather. It was you. It was you who threw away my name. And this is everything I have for me. Who has not Congress, lobster, love, luau, the Regency room, the Statue of Liberty runs, a sloppy amalgamation, a mistake, a cliff, a hymn, a snare, and an exceeding sun. Damn, that's such a great poem. So I'm going to start with Gabe, and I would like um, Amaris to be on deck second after Gabe. Okay, I think I have. I think I have a comment that's also a final word. You know, I think I think I can do it all. Um, so what I want to say is we've been thinking about documentary photography and documentary poetics, which in and of itself uh, assumes that it's trying to capture a moment. That's sort of a phrase we use a lot. So documentary has like this really strong relationship to a now, a now that it's trying to both invent and record. Um, but the, the kind of four objects that we've looked at today are sort of interesting with regards to this now because they're also so much about expectation, about waiting, about a future. In the first, in the White Angel Breadline and in Edwin Rolfe's poem, we have a, an as if in prayer the, uh, of hands locked around an object that is not religious, but, but seems to be an expectation of something. And I think that like, th that's a sort of interesting relationship for a documentary poetics to have because it's, it's capturing a waiting for a moment that isn't in the photograph. And I think that Brooks's poem is sort of a, a little bit of a turn from the other three because it's about um, a kind of moment in which somebody protests or protests their now um, through an act of making that Brooks is insisting is a making that uh, also gets sort of read as an unmaking or as a breaking. So it's a kind of revolt against one's now, but for Brooks, and I think for a lot of us um, in this current moment, that kind of revolt against your now feels like fighting for some kind of future of trying to make a world that is um, more ethical. That's all. Okay, that was everything you said it was gonna be. <laughs> A great, a great final thought and a great new reading of the poem. Thank you, Gabe. We're going to turn to Amaris, followed by Amber Rose. Yeah, I really love the assertive and dynamic nature of this poem. It's so um, full of energy and um, the boy breaking glass taking power back for himself. And as Gabe was saying, revolting against the now of um, forces that would try to relegate him to invisibility. Um, but he takes action in the way that he can. And I'm particularly struck um, by the last stanza where we have um, what seems to me kind of all these symbols of power in a more traditional sense, you know, Congress, governmental power, lobster material or luxury uh, material power, um, love and so forth um, versus the power that he um, holds up, which is the power of, of music, of art and of self-expression. 
Thank you, Amaris. That was really wonderful. Amber Rose next, followed by Allison on the phone. I hope she heard me. Um, yeah, I love this poem is so good. Um, I, yeah, I guess I want to, I, I was thinking along, what are words? Okay. <laughs> alongside uh, Gabe and his comments about protesting the now and that I, I agree that this looking at this poem feels like a shift. Um, the, I'm thinking about all of the waiting that was happening in the photographs and Brooks is talking about a moment when the waiting has gone on too long. Um, I'm thinking about that that last stanza. Um, this boy doesn't have Congress. Congress isn't helping. Doesn't have lobster. Doesn't have the luxury of lobster. Doesn't have love. Doesn't have the 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 imaginary of American liberty, and is now being asked to move and create something else. Um, to do something else. Um, to to make to to disrupt um, a kind of comfort in in lack. Um, mm -hmm. And to and to move into move into another kind of atmosphere, um, and I guess my final word is to read this poem again after the webcast ends, um, and share it with some folks, and and think about it, and think about what it means to move. I, I guess I was, I'm also thinking Al about you talking at the beginning about Lang making the choice to go outside. And one of the things that Lily responded and said is, well, what, what happens when you go outside? That just going outside is not enough, but it's about the actions that continue that, that, that continue from that point, from mm -hmm. step. Amber has a quick follow-up, then I want to turn to Allison. Um, I, I had this feeling, because we talked about this poem before, and we just checked in with each other the other day about things in general. I have a feeling that this poem is inspiring to you um, to do, to, you know, it's a cry of art. It gives, it, it gives a brilliant radical rationale for art as being an, not just an okay thing to do, but a, a responsiveness. Um, so my question is, how, how, how does it inspire, if it inspires you, how does it? And what do you want to do with it? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it does inspire me. And more than maybe it inspires me to create art myself it inspires me to look for art in different places um mm -hmm. so i'm thinking about as folks have moved to do more protests um the amount of street art that i'm seeing and spray painted signs and spray painted images and folks putting the mark putting their art on building walls on buses on backs of backpacks and there's so much conflicted conversation about how to interpret what we're seeing. And if we return to Brooks and see it as art and think about where that push for this kind of art comes from, it can actually help us think about and understand what's happening in a different and, and crucial light. Thank you, Ambrose, that was wonderful. Um, Allison, if you can hear me, would you have a thought on the Brooks? Well, Amber Rose, thank you for a wonderful reading and for an even better comment. I mean, it's, it's a tough act to follow. But what I'll say is I, I keep thinking about what Al, when Al opened up this conversation for us um, about the first photo and how he said, I know that maybe there isn't race in this photo. And it made me say to myself, well, it's not really what you can see in this photo in that sense, but it's what you can't see. And so much of our conversation right now about race and about the situation in the United States is all of the things that people sort of choose not to see or the lens or the photos that they take reflect a very specific kind of reality. And I'll just end with saying that, you know, I think you can't divorce race and capitalism in this country from one another. And the first line of this poem, whose broken window is a cry of art, should resonate with every person who has a problem with the destruction of property over the death of people. This is a 
signal to the world that it's not okay what's going on. Breaking something is an action that demonstrates, like they say, if you're not going to let me create, I'm going to destroy something in her poem, she says. So I would take that as, as the lesson that I'm walking away with today. Thank you, Allison. Radical is always. And you know, one of the things, when you said this, you may have been focusing on what you said and not looking at the gallery view, but I, I saw Max light up because I think that's, I think he shares the same point of view. So I want to turn to Max and then Kate for a, a thought on Brooks and then a final thought mixed in. My final thought um, on this poem and I guess our discussion in general is a little bit inspired by um, your comments at the beginning of the video discussion that was made for this poem, Al, a few years back, which I uh, had the pleasure of rewatching earlier today. And also by uh, just having spent uh, the month of May reading Gwendolyn Brooks in my Slopo um, session, uh, my month long Slopo session with on Brooks. And I was, I've was i just been thinking about glass as the medium of, of the sort of like, kind brutalist architecture that emerges in the post-war period um, and the kind of public space that that creates in cities and how that contrasts with um, I think the the public spaces that are hinted at at least in the, you know we don't quite get the full scope of of the setting of the Lang photos but there's a sort of commons that's that's hinted at where there's a kind of rabble, potentially a diverse rabble that's allowed to exist and not necessarily or not necessarily in like nice lines that there isn't there isn't this insistence on order um, in those spaces. And I'm thinking of of downtown Chicago uh, and Chicago in general, which Brooks wrote a lot about. Um, and downtown Chicago was all it's all very gridded and it was kind of like rebuilt starting in the 50s and 60s um, to be like this seemingly hospitable space with different plazas and these like glass international style um, skyscrapers, but it's in fact like quite hostile because it it sort of directs the wind down into public spaces and it's a little, it's like, it's not always the nicest place to be. There's no sunshine or anything. And it's like, uh, it's in fact like quite a hostile space to, um, to, to congregate. So I, I'm just imagining like Brooks, you know, maybe responding a little bit to the medium of, of glass and the sort of the, the power and authority that, that glass as a medium takes on um, in the post-war period during these projects of, of urban renewal. That's a great reading, Max. Uh, it doesn't take much to construe from what you said. Uh, the poem as a meta poem about a certain style of civic building yeah. that needed to have a couple of bricks thrown at it. You know, right. So that's really that's strongly implied, I would say. I'm, I'm <laughs> that style. Thank you, Max from Chicago. Um, Kate Colby, uh, you're next. And then uh, I'd like for uh, Lily to add her final thought after that. I wanted to call attention to another meaning for the word art, which is of intention in the sense of artlessness or artfulness, um, and how the poem immediately in that first line gives agency to the speaker and the committer of this act of breaking glass. Um, and I loved reading it in counterpoint to the Rolf and the Lang photographs, because it's so much about um, individual expression and particularity of experience and of the act committed here. And even though the speaker is nameless in the, in the poem invokes the namelessness of, of, of the boy and also you know, a wider set of people that he um, represents here, he, with the quotations throughout, there's this repeated reminder that this is one boy, this is one act, this is an individual, this is, you know, a reminder of his particularity. Lovely, thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, I want to turn to Lily, then Kamara. Sorry. Um, well, I wanted to respond a little bit to what Kate just said about um, um, individuality, because maybe what I'm going to say is pushing back on it, on that, or maybe reinforces what Kate said, I'm not sure, but um, I was thinking a lot about the pronouns and subjectivity in the poem, and um, I think 
the pronouns really stick out to me. There's our, you and your, and I and my, and they're all used in different contexts, including inside the, the quotation marks. And I've been thinking a lot about um, my reading or interpretation of how the quotation, the stanzas in quotes are used are that maybe it's Brooks almost like throwing her voice and speaking from the boy's um, subjectivity or point of view. Um, and so in, in general, I'm just thinking about if we could draw a correlation between the quotation marks, like the quoted phrases, the pronoun use in this poem and the ways that the speaker is claiming um, relation and like a relationship to the subject, the boy, um, a care for and love for him and a consideration of his subjectivity. Um, that's like something I find really moving about this poem. Um, and then just to connect it to what we were talking about earlier in the conversation, um, Sarah talked about um, just some ways that you could see in the White Angel Breadline photograph, um, some of the photographer's subject, some of Dorothea Lange's subjectivity or uh, like a foregrounding of the fact that we're using um, the medium of photography, not just like a clear window into what's happening, that you can see the guardrails and some slanted lines and things like that, like that indicate the framing. So that's what I've been thinking about is how to put those two elements of the two artworks together. As usual, I love all the points that you've made, Lily, but the last one is really a rock'em sock'em because it reminds everybody that art is not a transparency. And the, the artists we admire tend to be ones that make it clear that this is not a transparency, that we are, that the act of seeing is shaping what is seen. And those guardrails are, in a sense, guardrails against that easy thought. Kamara Brown, your, your, your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I think this, this poem for me, reading it again speaks to the importance and significance and uh, beauty of like rereading this rereading this poem in this moment was like shattering for me in terms of how I how I interpreted the poem and specifically reading it out loud I think I've talked about this before maybe with this poem that reading out loud you can see the multiplicity of layers of meaning in terms of the homophones of like uh, if not a note, a whole it makes me think of a whole note actually which like is a whole like that is held throughout a whole music bar. Um, when Amber Rose is reading it again, each one other reminds, one reminds me of what, what weather, you know? I think that this exceeding sun, a sun, a him and H-I-M, all these sort of homophones or sonic qualities of the poem make me think that the poem, rereading it is important, but like re-saying it out loud, the voice of the poem really, comes forward for me. And so, I don't know, when I was rereading it, I kept on feeling as if uh, Brooks or someone who was speaking the poem was trying to get me to speak, speak it out loud, to speak these cries out loud and speak these uh, lines out loud. And it makes me um, think about, I don't know, sort of, uh, yeah, um, sort of what, um, it's calling me to do here and sort of think about my own voice and the relationship between it and the language and to take it back to the photograph. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a sort of wrapping up of a final word on this, but a question of like, how do we think about voice in these photographs when, um, yes, we don't see many eyes or faces, but we also don't see any mouths. And um, what can we hear from these photographs when we listen is something that I've been thinking about. Mm. Thinking about mm. voice. Thank you, Kamara. Uh, I have a quick final thought on the poem. Um, I've talked a lot over the years about the broken window uh, here, but today I have two new contexts for that thought, um, and they and they they militate against each other. The one uh, association I have is with now with Dorothea Lang. Um, we like to say, well, you know, Brooks, who very much knew the modernist uh, fragmentation of someone like William Carlos Williams, you know, was thinking about modern art, maybe Picasso like Cubist, but also um, Williams with all of his broken glass. Um, but I don't think so. I think 
that by the time you get to the 30s, which is such an important foundation idea period phase for Brooks, who's really doing most of her writing later, uh, Broken Window is about someone like Lang, who was among the first to go out into the depression economic devastation and think that broken windows and broken people and buildings falling down and the dust bowl and machinery that won't work because it's filled with dust and jalopies that won't take people out to the you know the promised land of California where they're going to get discriminated against as farm workers anyway that that broken window needed to be the art of the time that's the art of crisis the broken window take a photo of it and see the geometry of it and see it as beautiful and inspiring of all the homonymic uh, amazingness that you can get when you're a good artist. Um, the other reference to Broken Window, which is I've used in videos before about this, now is back in the news. And that is the erroneous, mistaken, and finally ultimately racist theory of policing of the policy of making sure every broken window gets either repaired or criminalized, the breaking of it gets criminalized, you wind up spending enormous amounts of police funding trying on this theory that you're gonna prevent much worse from happening, much greater degradations from happening. This is now, I think everybody has admitted it, even a candidate for president who used to be the mayor of New York admitted it, um, broken window. You know, it's almost as if Brooke is, Brooks is looking forward to the future where finally we will see broken windows as not just the invitation to an aesthetic view of destruction as beautiful in its thought, but um, as a policing policy, this boy, breaking glass, the first word is whose. It's not that he owns the glass, probably doesn't own the building in which the glass is broken, but he owns, as it were, the breaking of the glass. He's willing to own it. 